So hello and welcome to Extra Shot, the programme where we share our over-caffeinated views on all things telecoms. My name is Ray Lemaitre, I'm the Editorial Director at Telecom TV, and I'm here to host this series of Extra Shot programmes that looks at some of the key topics discussed during the recent DSP Leaders World Forum digital event. Now I'm joined during these programmes by some special guests, but each week I'm also joined by my co-hosts, colleagues and friends as Guy Daniels from Telecom TV and industry analyst Chris Lewis, who is the MD of Lewis Insight. Guy and Chris, welcome again. Welcome, Ray. Nice to be back. Oh, I'm loving, I'm feeling the enthusiasm. This is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> OK, um, so now this is our fourth extra shot. Uh, you can find the other programmes in the video section on the Telecom TV website, where you can also go back to episode one and check our different hairstyles. There's some mullets in progress. I can tell you that right now. Now, in this episode, we're focusing on connectivity and the resurgence of telecoms. And our special guests today are Matthias Friedström, who is Chief Evangelist at Telia Carrier, and Kerry Gilder, who is CEO at Colt Technology Services. And as ever, we're in the Telecom TV virtual coffee shop. So let's start today's programme by finding out what our special guests like to order when they go to a coffee shop. So let's start with Matthias from Telia Carrier. Uh, I'm really in the coffee fan club, uh, and I don't really care so much about the bean, but I really love a big bucket of latte. Well, maybe I should be reconsidering my tiny little espresso cups after this. Um, so let's turn now to Kerry and find out whether she's in the tea fan club or the coffee fan club or neither. <laughs> I am both. I'm a coffee in the morning and a tea in the afternoon and evening. So my preference is definitely a black Americano. I like it just very, very basic. I like French and Italian style beans. And I'd say on if I want a special treat, I will make it with Kona coffee from Hawaii. Okay, okay. I think that's our first our first call in at, um, at the Hawaiian coffee shop uh, in Extra Shot. Good to hear. OK, let's get stuck into today's key topic, and that's connectivity. Now, this has always been the mainstay of the telecom operators, but its fundamental importance has really come to the fore uh, this year during the coronavirus pandemic and the subsequent uh, creation of a more distributed workforce. So as a result, network operators are now more than ever regarded as the communications foundations of pretty much every vertical there is in the world. So how can network operators build on this? What can they do that's even better for their customers? Uh, let's start and hear from Matthias at Telia Carrier. Uh, I think that's a good question. And I think uh, looking at the national networks, I think there is a golden opportunity right now. You know, uh, in, in most countries in Europe, fiber development have been coming. It's been built out to a lot of places, but I think there's also a lot of places that haven't received fibers yet. And some have been quite hesitant because it's a quite big investment to go for fiber. But I think what this uh, this time has shown now is the importance of having great connectivity. And therefore, I think the appetite for spending more money now to build out networks into various parts of the countryside where you didn't have any good solution before is much higher than it was before. And I think it's a golden opportunity now for operators to extend their networks into the areas where they haven't been extended before. OK, interesting. Um, I mean, is this the time for operators to be taking fibre into maybe underserved areas or, or, or places where they, they wouldn't have built it out before? Chris, what do you think? I think the issue of fibre rollout is, of course, critical for every country, every operator. But in my mind, that's more of a mid to long term. If we start planning now, it, because of all the issues about regulation and way leaves, we need to think about it more long term. The short term issue is much more around making sure we can deliver broadband that's fit for purpose and that's fixed and mobile. And of course, if we in underserved areas, that may well be mobile in the short term because it's quicker to roll out than getting that fiber dug in the ducks and all the services rolled out. Great. Thanks, Chris. 
And now, when I spoke about the lessons learned from the past few months with Kerry Gilder at Colt, who is only just a little more than a month into that role, uh, she talked about creating a new norm. Let's hear what she had to say. So I think this past period, as tumultuous as it's been, has really given our sector a renewed sense of purpose, as you stated. In a matter of days, we had to transform the way that literally the world was working through this power around communications. So we broke all the rules uh, in the book around competition and we collaborated as one team across the entire globe to deliver for our customers, you know, our countries and our communities. So what can we do different? Yeah. Well, first we can make this the new norm. We can make stronger connections via APIs and software-defined networking. We can build platforms that enable the full ecosystem to deliver a highly reliable, secure, and effortless service. And I think what we also need to do is be ready because this is a black swan, but there'll be another one that comes. And we need to build crisis teams across companies, not just within our own teams and companies, in order to ensure we're ready for that next black swan event as it comes. Okay. I Guy, do you think that the, the, the network operators are now going to be prepared and, and, and ready for any eventuality that, that's put their way? Yes, the, the black swan theory, the event that creeps up on us unexpectedly, gives us a bit of a kicking and then we try and make sense of what the heck just happened to us. Um, there will be another one, um, sooner rather than later, unfortunately. I think the telcos are ready for what's coming next. They are a resilient lot by and large. I think like many other companies though, this is a great chance for them to review their processes. Um, I think they acquitted themselves very well. Um, we've heard a, a, a range of views during DSP leaders and since from various telcos I think these views are now starting to sound a little more political, with a small p on political, more for the ears of investors and regulators. Um, but really, never mind the black swan, it's more black sheep up here at Telecom TV's Yorkshire studio, which incidentally, <laughs> black sheep is the name of a cracking good beer brewed just up the road, although I wouldn't mix it with coffee. If you're looking for ways to put me off, Guy, that's exactly the way to do it. <laughs> Segway from telco strategies into beer and then into coffee. I mean, hey, what are you going to do? Um, now, one of the other... <laughs> Don't do it again. That's what I'm saying. Uh, now, one of the other outcomes of recent months is that uh, companies of, of all size, all sizes, enterprises, have had a chance to reconsider uh, and look at their strategies um, in all manners, you know, how they, how they work, how they go about their business. And of course, one of the things they've been able to, to look at and reconsider are their communication service options. So let's hear from Matthias uh, on this topic. I think many enterprises haven't really thought about what type of telecom solution they had. You know, that's been like, you know, it's been like this for a long time and it works okay. Uh, now it, it kind of really, uh, showed who were prepared and who were not prepared. And I think operators now have a golden opportunity to talk to their enterprise customers to discuss, you know, okay, your solution maybe was quite old and you should look for something new. What can we do for you? Uh, what are you prepared to change? You know, how can we change this for you? And how can we make sure you have a, an upper, a network that is fit for purpose? Uh, I think many network architects have been sort of yeah, they've been quite low down in the organization. Some people have asked them, you know, keep this alive. That's good enough. You know, our focus is much more on other stuff, application servers and everything. But I think now uh, the importance of the telecom networks have come up again, surfaced again, and people really need to look through what type of solution do they have. And that's a golden opportunity for operators. Okay, very interesting point. And uh, Matthias mentions there a golden opportunity. But, but Chris, do you think this is as much a potential nightmare or a hurdle for telcos as well as an opportunity if enterprises are starting to reconsider about what services they have or what they might need? 
I think Mateus presents a very carrier centric view of, of the issue there. I think if you turn it around and think about the enterprise and what they're trying to achieve, you know, they they've moved everybody to work from home. They will now gradually begin to look at new patterns of gradually moving people to become office based or wherever they, they, they need to do their jobs. So I think the flexibility of services that perhaps wasn't there in the old systems or the old services that we've had for many, many years on the wide area side. So that, that's the reconsideration. And of course, you know, the the enterprises are not just looking at the connectivity side. They're looking at how cloud changes the way they deploy their applications and put their workflows. So there is a big opportunity for the telcos here, but they have to much clearer understand what the enterprise is trying to do rather than try and, as in the past, force fit them into the services that the telcos had available to them. OK, great. Thanks, Chris. And of course, one of the other things that we've seen in the past few months as uh, companies and individuals change the way that they live and work is that there's been a shift in the traffic trends that the operators have been seeing on their network. So, so let's hear again from Matthias about what he's been seeing in the Telia carrier network. Since the beginning of March, we've seen a tremendous uplift of traffic in the network. And really overall, uh, absolutely from every angle, you know, from the gaming traffic to the networking traffic, to the normal telecom traffic, to mobile traffic, Pretty much it's grown really everywhere, but the few things stands out. And I would say uh, the video conferencing traffic, we've seen a 10x or even a 15x increase in that traffic. Obviously, based on that people are working from home and people are not traveling too much between countries. So therefore, a lot more video conferencing, a lot more uh, working from home where you need to be connected practically the entire day to stay uh, to stay in sh in contact with your colleagues and your customers and your suppliers. So uh, an, an enormous increase overall. Uh, basically, every day looks like a Sunday now. You know, Sundays were typically the day when traffic started to increase already in the afternoon. That is happening right now as well. Okay, every day is like Sunday, guy. Apart from that, any major surprises for you? It sounds like a cue to a Morrissey song, doesn't it? I, I really hope not, because <laughs> if you do look up those lyrics, they are massively depressing and uh, a bit Armageddon-focused. In fact, we'll put a link on the page for when you finish this video. You can go look for them yourself. Um, what surprised me most, I guess, was the increase in voice traffic. Um, we were hearing that from a lot of our guests at DSP leaders. Um, Decline in email traffic as well, especially towards the beginning of the, the pandemic. Um, I am looking forward to analysing these traffic patterns later once we're all out of the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, something that Matthias said well, about video conferencing and the, the 15 times increase he was talking about. Personally, I was a little bit annoyed at the rather knee-jerk reaction that came out of the EU to lower streaming quality um, and the major... VOD platforms complied straight away. Uh, and when you consider that came from the EU's industry chief, Thierry Breton, who was the former head of France Telecom, he ought to know better about how networks are architected and how they work. That was a bit disappointing. Perhaps you thought we'd all be lounging at home watching movies, Black Swan, anyone, um, instead of doing the essential video conferencing work and, and homeschooling. Um, Chris, w what about yourself? W did you pick up any of the uh, traffic changes? Uh, what I found fascinating was the fact that, you know, in the, the the split between fixed and mobile, and the fact that the the fixed network appears to have carried the the bulk of the of this growth in traffic, because of course when we're in our homes with our mobile devices, then they tend to default across the Wi-Fi network. So it's that Wi-Fi to fixed combination that that has really uh, been supported. So in fact, some mobile operators actually saw a decline in some of their traffic. So I, I'm not surprised generally increases in, you know, we've seen a lot of collaboration tools done, done very, very well. Uh, the gaming, of course, because people do spend some downtime, Guy, you know, they do get away from researching about the industry. You know, so there's, there are some changes. And, but no, generally, I, mean, the, I think the great news is the, the, the networks cope extremely well. You know, the fact is, if this had happened 10 years ago, we'd have been in real trouble because we would never, never have got the, the, the level of throughput. And in terms of fitness for purpose, then we're absolutely there. Uh, and of course, we can build on that going forward. OK, so all in all, then the telcos can give themselves a little bit of a pat on the back. Uh, but can they afford to take a breather? I mean, what happens as companies now 
start to, to go back more towards their normal ways of working. Staff start to go back to offices, more and more companies and, and people start to use facilities back in the cities again. Um, you know, Chris, what kind of impact do you think that will have? With the, will the service providers be able to cope with that kind of that slower shift back to what used to be regarded as normal? Well, I think the issue is is that we we had a one size fits all when everybody moved from being in the in the central locations to the to the suburbs, and we saw all those uh, traffic patterns and the hot spots that different organisations presented. As we as we gradually move back, and it's very unclear company by company how that how that will change. Then, of course, it, it's an even more of a burden on the operators to make sure they've got the availability, the flexibility to move the traffic around to make sure people can get the service required as and when they go back into those those more central locations. So in, in a way, this sort of fits in with the theory that in the past, businesses had to fit, fit themselves and organize themselves around fairly rigid communication services. But I believe this is truly a time when the operators need to understand the dynamics of the customer, both consumer and, and business customers, and actually allow the service to fit around those requirements. So much closer to the to the reality of how we would like to use those services and consume those services rather than the way the engineers would like them to be deployed in the past. Great, Chris. And, and Guy, any closing thoughts on this, the, this our topic today of connectivity? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we're talking about the, the, the changes to how Toco should um, provision and the, the, their services and the focus on the customer. I think it may have a, a, a knock-on effect on the ongoing standardization work. I mean, we're already hearing that the 3GPP's 5G work is delayed by a quarter simply because of the difficulties in, in working um, in an online environment rather than the, the massive face-to-face -face meetings they do rely on. Um, might push back some of the 5G work a little bit, might end this so-called race, which wouldn't be a bad thing after all. Um, it might be another opportunity for us to generally review where we're focused going forward, um, have a good industry-wide review, usual situation, too many projects, too many bodies, too few people, too few resources. We should grab all the opportunities to, to refocus. Um, and it's not just about COVID-19. I mean, the, uh, the gaming traffic, for instance, is a great example. The big spike in gaming traffic came because two of the, the leading online games providers released game updates at the same time. So, you know, wallop, that hits the network hard. And Ray, if I might add one further thing in there, there, are, there were many already existing underlying trends around the transformation of the telcos themselves and towards this DSP concept. One of the questions is, would, will there be a bit of a, a burnout, a COVID hangover issue, which slows down further investment? Or indeed, will some people actually use, uh, someone mentioned to me the other day, you know, never waste a crisis to try and sneak other things into the budget that might actually get through uh, with a little, little less scrutiny than, uh, than perhaps in the past. So we may see those who are perhaps farther down the line of digitization, accelerating it. We may see some falling even further behind. So it's worth looking at every individual operator and their strategies and what they've been doing and uh, to see how they progress off the back of COVID-19. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Chris. So this brings us towards the end of a, another Extra Shot programme. But before we go, of course, we should check up and get an update on where we are on the Extra Shot containerized beverage function leaderboard. So uh, let's see how today's input has uh, has changed the leaderboard here well as we can see Kerry Gilder has uh, has joined the growing but small group that's uh, on the fence between coffee and tea but guy we might have to start deploying smaller pictures of people if we're gonna uh, if everybody's gonna lean towards coffee all the time and nobody joins Neil McRae in the neither camp we're gonna have to shrink them down um, be because I can't see I can't see we're going to succeed with load balancing because there's just not enough tea drinkers out there. <laughs> I, feel, I feel we might need to do some containerized beverage function slicing here and start segmenting the coffee group into those <laughs> who just take it black and those like Matthias who like to add you know six pints worth of milk uh, into their coffee and uh, and start doing that way <laughs> otherwise it's gonna it's, be, it's gonna become very, incredibly unbalanced. Oh and look guys and we've we've run out of time again for me to ask you what your hot beverage options are another time. We'll have to come back to that. Okay, so 
Uh, this does bring us to the end of another programme. So Guy and Chris, thanks very much for, for joining me again today. Always You're a welcome, pleasure. Mate. Good to talk to you. And thank you uh, to everybody for joining us and watching the programme. And as ever, carry on supping.